Hello there and welcome to Science Epic's 60 Years of the Space Age, a Malaysian internet podcast series that recounts the history of the human presence in outer space from the launch of Sputnik in 1957 until the present day in 2018. It's the 60 year anniversary of human beings going to outer space beginning in October of 1957. I'm your hostess with the mostest on this flight across time and space as we retell the adventures of humankind taking its first steps out into the cosmos and the great beyond. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. You are now tuned in to Science Epics, 60 Years of the Space Age. Sixty Years of the Space Age, Part 12, The First Humans in Space. The title of today's episode is The First Human in Space, and I'm saying human instead of man as to not offend any third-wave feminists or social justice warriors out there by using a word that does not exclude any significant subset of the human race in the title. I figure that humans is a pretty good umbrella term to be used, even though in this story it was Yuri Gagarin, a patriarchal white male that gets most of the attention and credit. But Gagarin was actually a nice guy, and feminists and SJWs can bite me. Also, as we will discover later on in the story of the space age, the ladies are equally as capable of pulling their punches in zero-g environments, and that's no joke. Anyway, this is part 12 of our story, 60 Years of the Space Age, where we attempt to retell the journey of humanity to outer space from the launch of Sputnik, until the present day. So I've taken inspiration from podcasts like The Great War, where they recount the story of World War I 100 years ago to this day, the day that it happened. For those of you who are space enthusiasts, science geeks, and historians alike, do stay tuned. I'd like to think there's a bit of space enthusiast, science geek, and historian in every person on planet Earth, in every human being, no matter what set of denomination they are, whether they're gay, straight, trans or vegan so yeah it should be an interesting ride for everyone this is our 12th episode of 60 years and also our second in 2018 in the last episode we talked about the soviet luna program that happened a few years following the founding of nasa in 1958 in part 11 entitled luna and the moon that was the last episode we saw how the soviet union continued to impress the world with the sheer power of their rocket engines by sending the first ever spacecraft to travel from Earth to the moon. So if you want to know more about that, y'all can find it in the channel playlist. In this episode, the Soviets will continue to amaze again. For part 12 of our podcast, as we continue our march into outer space, we take a look at the experience of the first men, and maybe some Andals, (laughs) Game of Thrones reference right there, that managed to escape their home planet and for the briefest of moments enter into the vast interstellar void of outer space. Today, we tell the story of the first astronauts. Well, a topic like this really needs no introduction. You've probably learned about this person's name in school or maybe asked your parents about it at some point in your life when you were very young. Like, Mommy, Daddy, have people ever gone to space? Asked little Johnny at an age when he probably just figured out that space was a thing. A very tender age indeed. I'm sure everyone went through that. And if you think about it, at one point of life, in the life of all human beings, have probably asked some sort of similar question. And your parents will probably tell you about the first person to go to space nearly 60 years ago. His name was Yuri Gagarin. The first thing you'll notice is that his name sounds uniquely Russian, and that's because he was Russian. 
Yuri Alexeyevich Gagarin was the first human being to ever go to outer space. In Russia, they called him a cosmonaut, which kind of stands for sailor of the cosmos or traveler of the cosmic ocean or something like that. And he embraced this role in style on the 12th of April, 1961, 57 years ago, launching to space on a rocket called the Vostok 1, or in Russian, that would be Vostok Adin. It's a modified version of Korolev's R7 that we've been talking about for many podcasts now. But before that historic flight into the history books, our boy Yuri actually had quite the humble beginnings. Like most of the people from the Soviet Union at that time in the 50s and the 60s, his story would be greatly affected by the Great Patriotic War, the name the Russians give to World War II. It's that time again. Cue Soviet Anthem. Man, that anthem gets me a hard on. Born in the small village of Klushino in Smolensk Oblast in Russia, his father was a carpenter and his mother was a milkmaid. Yuri was the third of four children. The Gagarin family suffered during the German invasion of Russia during World War II, with some of his older siblings being captured by the Germans and used as slave labor, but managed to return home after the war, of which, after which the entire family moved to this place called Gazitsk. Gzatsk, Gazistak, sorry, my Russian is not too good. Yuri Gagarin worked at a steel plant near Moscow while enrolled as a young, at a young worker's school for 7th grade evening classes. Afterwards, he went to Saratov Industrial Technic school, Technical School. Now, this place, keyword Saratov, will play a later significance in our story, so keep that in mind, Saratov, where he studied tractors. On the weekends, he would learn to fly planes as a member of the Soviet air cadets. Yuri was also a part-time dock laborer on the Volga River, the most important river in all of Russia. Volga River is actually also the place where Stalingrad is, where the Russians managed to halt the German advance in World War II. But anyway, this little origin story about Yuri really gives you some insight into life in the Soviet Union. Besides chasing your dreams to fly high and become an astronaut or a pilot, a pilot or an astronaut, you have to put yourself to work, son, and then you get to go to space. So like most astronauts today, you have to practice flying airplanes first before you get to fly space planes. And that's usually the common way to do it. But back then, in, 1960, in the early 1960s, there was no precedence for a career path to becoming an astronaut or cosmonaut because there had never been any cosmonauts or astronauts. Space was still awaiting its first human visitor. Yuri Gagarin would join the Air Force, becoming a senior lieutenant in 1959 at the age of 25-26, which is about the same age as me right now. A year later, the wheels of destiny would begin to turn in his direction as there began a selection process by the Soviet space program, the one run by Sergei Korolev, to find the first possible Soviet cosmonaut. He was part of that selection process involving 200 other candidates, then shortlisted in a group of 20. Those were the odds it took to become the chosen one. And these guys were all the cream of the crop aviators of Russia. Pilots, top pilots, like Soviet Top Gun, except with extra glistening volleyball sweat and even cooler call signs like borscht and pierogi. <laughs> and they were looking for people with the right stuff. It's, it's a common phrase in astronaut selection, referring to the boldest, the brightest, and the toughest. To send to an unknown and dangerous place where any number of things could go terribly wrong. Now this right stuff is also a common selection criteria for Navy SEALs and other jobs that require a high degree of intelligent awareness as well as physical fitness. Funny thing though, for the first cosmonauts, they weren't really looking for huge, muscular, jacked up ape men because Vostok 1 spaceship, the spaceship that Yuri was to fly in, had limited room. Yuri Gagarin was a humble five foot two. In the end, it came down to two in the selection process, Yuri Gagarin and another man named German Taitov, who would later become the second person in space. Now, this is what Soviet Air Force doctor said about 
Gagarin's character, and I quote, modest, embarrasses his humor when it gets a little too racy, a high degree of intellectual development evident in Yuri, fantastic memory, distinguishes himself from his colleagues by his sharp and far-ranging sense of attention to his surroundings, a well-developed imagination, quick reactions, persevering, prepares himself painstakingly for his activities and training exercises, handles celestial mechanics and mathematical formula with ease as well as excels in higher mathematics does not feel constrained when he has to defend his point of view if he considers himself right. Appears that he understands life better than a lot of his friends. Unquote. Now, it sounds like quite a remarkable individual. I wonder what it would be like to drink vodka with him. Would make for interesting conversation. I bet by the third shot, he'd probably be speaking about some space stuff in Russian, and I'd probably be speaking some strange alien dialect. Blah, 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 blah. Now, Yuri Gagarin was definitely the right man at the right place and at the right time, too. And on April 12, 1961, Yuri Alexevich Gagarin was placed on the verge of destiny. Vostok 1 would be his chariot into the history books. Vostok 1, also referred to as East or Orient 1, was the first manned spacecraft and the first manned space flight in the history of mankind. A major milestone for a species that, be that began as hunters and gatherers with ape-like origins. And now the apes get to leave their planetary home like they left the savannas of their humble beginning. Before dawn on the 12th of April 1961, both Yuri Gagarin and German Taitov were prepared for launch. Yuri was definitely the one to step up and go into space first. But German was there as a backup in case anything were to happen. I don't think I'm pronouncing German right. German, not German, that's more of a German name, but German Taitov was the backup just in case anything were to happen. Gagarin was led into a spacecraft and the hatch was sealed. There he waited for two hours, chiller than the iceberg that took out the Titanic as the engineers meticulously checked, double checked and triple checked everything. Interestingly enough, he requested for music to be played on the radio. Мы в космос улетаем на работу, Прикуем на орбите корабли, А все ведет начало от первого полета. And seemed to be very calm. While the chief designer, Sergei Korolev, and leader of the Soviet pro space program, on the other hand, appeared to be quite anxious. Honestly, I think the glory of the moment belonged to both men. At 6.07 a.m. on the morning of April 12, 1961, Baikonur Cosmodrome site number Adin was awoken to the launch of Vostok 1. Sergei Korolev radioed Yuri Gagarin as the liftoff commenced, as the rocket engines were being fired, and after the formalities of the ignition checks, he wished Gagarin, we wish you a good flight, everything is all right. Gagarin, instead of replying with a formal radio response, said, Poyakali, or let's go. That would be the equivalent of like, Jom in Malay, or Allons in French. Yeah, so let me play a soundbite of what this exchange might have sounded like. Just a few minutes into the flight, the four strap-on boosters spent their fuel and detached from the main rocket, briefly forming the famous Korolev Cross, shimmering in the morning sky before tumbling back down to Earth on the Kazakh steppes. A few minutes later, the payload fairing, that's the front cover of the rocket that protects the spacecraft module, detached, allowing for Gagarin to peer out the window. By the time the core stage of the rocket finished its burn, Gagarin was already at the edge of space. He radioed back to the ground that all was well and he could see certain amounts of space under the cumulus cloud cover. His altitude must have been at least 100 kilometers away from ground level. Gagarin was very enthusiastic during the flight, 
on that he could keep and he was urging on that he could keep going Poyakali between the status reports back to ground control. Now, 10 minutes after launch, communications between Vostok and ground control were out of range and the rocket final stage shut down. Moments later, Gagarin's capsule, the Vostok 1, separated from the main body of the rocket. The first human being had reached outer space. Now, to kind of imagine really how it would feel like to be up there more than 100 kilometers away from home as the first human being to ever enter low Earth orbit, about 100 kilometers straight up off the ground from ground level. There's this anime called The Royal Space Force, The Wings of Honimais. And there's a part at the end when the character who finally makes it up to space as the first member of his species to make it to space there's like a flashback scene where the entire history of his species is played out and he's dr as he's drifting out there in space as if everything that has happened has culminated in that moment for the character to be in space like that. And I highly recommend that anime for those of you who do fancy animes. It's really cool. And if you could imagine the journey of humanity as being comprised of flashpoint, flashpoint moments in history, and the, the people who were conscious during those moments as painters of a grand tapestry telling the total experience of humankind then that view that Gagarin saw out of his porthole window on the morning of April 12th would truly have been a one-of-a-kind picture for humanity. That's what I want to say. And for, for Gagarin, it would have been sort of the same, the first human being in space, the bards, would sing of that moment for many years to come, so long as there would be bards to sing songs about things. Now, Gagarin's flight, or Gagarin's route, would take him on a single orbit, single round trip around the Earth, where he would fly across the heart of Russia, over Kamchatka, Siberia, where Korolev, the designer of the rocket that sent him to space, was imprisoned more than 20 years before, and the capsule will continue on its orbit making a diagonal cut over the Pacific Ocean. The last Russian ground station that Gagarin was in contact with was this place called Khabarovsk, a remote settlement in the Russian Far East. The, the second largest settlement in the Russian Far East, the first, the largest would be Vladivostok. As he was flying over the Pacific Ocean, he continually asked for status checks on his orbital path. And Khabarov station didn't have any updates to give him because there were none from ground control because of this 20-minute delay from the time of the launch until where Gagarin was as he was entering the Pacific Ocean. So Khabarov just told him, Khabarov's radio ground station just told him to proceed as normal. Now, it's moments like that where astronaut intuition and pilot intuition have to just kick in. Sometimes in space flight, you don't have the whole picture, and you can't just call it quits because there's no direct instruction from command and control. You are hurtling through space at more than 100 kilometers above the Earth with no brakes, man. You just got to ride that wave and hope that nothing bad happens. And as Vostok 1 approached the radio horizon with Khabarovsk, which is the farthest extent that radio waves can be sent to a receiver due to diffraction and a host of other phenomena, Gagarin got one last message from Khabarovsk, Khabarovsk before finally losing communications to the station. He briefly told the station that he was okay, and he asked for a status check on his flight. Five minutes later, he entered sunset on the Pacific, the first human to witness sunset from orbit. It would cross into night northwest of the Hawaiian Islands. Everything was dark, yet onwards he flew over the ocean towards the Strait of Magellan, the southern tip of South America. 
At that point, he switched on the sun-seeking attitude controller that would automatically guide the spacecraft towards the sun side of the Earth. There was also a manual flight mode, a visually driven flight mode, and either method could be used to control the Vostok 1 that used nitrogen gas thrusters that gives the spacecraft the little bumps in space in order to send it to where it needs to go. But it was generally safer to use the computer, and even nowadays, most of the flight that we do involving complex maneuvers, we just let the computer do it. And generally, as he was flying across night, everything was proceeding very well 57 years ago. Nearing 7 a.m., about an hour, almost an hour after the launch, Gagarin had crossed the Strait of Magellan as news of his historic flight was finally being broadcast on the radio back in Russia. One hour since the launch, about 7 at 7.10 a.m., the spacecraft had entered daylight over the South Atlantic, somewhere between South America and Africa. The epic journey was nearly over as the retro rockets of the Vostok would soon fire off in order to slow down the craft for final descent and return back to Earth. The retro rockets are like these stopper rockets. As the spacecraft flew diagonally over Africa, somewhere over Angola, on its course back to Russia, the retro rockets, which are these rocket engines that provide a counter thrust in order to slow down the spacecraft, were fired. Psst. The come down flight was a little turbulent, but Gagarin still continued communicated. When he could communicate, he kept on communicating that he was okay, despite the vibrations and the gyrations in the spacecraft. <laughs> Everything was shaking. During his re-entry, he experienced 8 Gs of force. 8 Gs, man. Talk about 8 Gs. You know, rappers like to talk about Gs. Astronauts handle Gs, too. 8 Gs of force, but which is 8 times the gravitational ex acceleration on Earth. At 5 minutes to 8 a.m., that's 7.55, on April 12, 1961, during the descent back to Earth, the hatch to the Vostok 1 was released. The craft was 7 kilometers from the ground. 7 kilometers, that's lower than the traditional altitude of most commercial airliners, so his landing was really skin-of-your-teeth stuff. Gagarin had to be ejected moments later, more than 2 kilometers, that's 8,000 feet away from the ground. So he had to make a jump. As if his flight wasn't already life-threatening enough by being the first space flight, this guy had to end it by parachuting two kilometers away from the surface of the Earth. And when he did that, two schoolgirls act actually watched both Gagarin and the remnants of his spacecraft come down via parachute. The Vostok module actually bounced off the ground on its first impact, leaving a big hole where it hit the Earth. The landing happened somewhere in Saratov, where Gagarin had gone to school as a much younger man. Like I said, keep that place in mind, Saratov, that's where he landed. And both the spacecraft and the cosmonaut actually missed the intended landing site close to Baikonur by 2800. But hey, at least they were okay, right? In total, the entire flight lasted nearly two hours. Two hours from Baikonur to Saratov, flying eastwards around the Earth, making one orbit, or actually nearly close to completing an entire orbit because they fell short. Just, just a little short. Gagarin's flight took place well within low Earth orbit throughout its duration. Now, I talked about this in another video of mine, that low Earth orbit generally begins at 150 kilometer altitude away from the surface of the Earth. Throughout most of the flight, he was within that boundary. It was a pretty clean flight, too. The only thing that fell short was the landing site. Beyond that, most of the journey was pretty smooth for a first attempt at orbital flight. Korolev and his team had clearly done an excellent job in setting things up. Clap, clap. Round of applause for the scientists. Hell yeah. Now the first humans Gagarin came into contact with upon his return were a farmer and her daughter. 
They were startled by the sudden arrival of this strange man from space dressed in a bright orange flight suit and a big white helmet dragging a parachute behind. I mean, it's not every day you see something like that, especially in 1960. But he quickly calmed them down by claiming that he too was a Soviet citizen just like them and that he badly needed to telephone Moscow. Several hours later that morning, Gagarin would be picked up by the Red Army and sent back from Moscow to Moscow for debriefing. Things would never be the same afterwards for humanity and for Gagarin, for Yuri Gagarin. Like when mankind invented fire, mankind had just invented space flight, a means by which its members could escape the toils of the home planet and perhaps find a utopia anywhere else among the cosmos. Ever since April 12, 1961, 57 years ago, we've been put in a position where we could liberate ourselves in that manner. Small steps for now, maybe big giant leaps, maybe one day in the future. But the first man to have ever taken a step anywhere in that measure, his name was Yuri Alexevich Gagarin. Upon his return, Gagarin was made a national hero and celebrity. He was awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union, which was the highest award that can be given out by the Soviet Union. Cue Soviet Anthem. He went on tours all over the world and visited all sorts of places. I may do a further episode just talking about the life of Yuri Gagarin in general as the first spaceman. It would be interesting to explore further that life in detail despite what would happen to him in later. No spoilers! No spoilers this time. Now the United States was quick to congratulate the Soviet Union over their success, but in truth, deep down, they were kind of stressed out. They were dumbfounded, thunderstruck, as well as humbled by Soviet space capability. They were spurred before by Sputnik, an inanimate object that made a few revolutions around the Earth. And now, a living, breathing human being had gone into space, and he wasn't an American. Less than a month later, America would catch up to the Soviet Union, where Mercury astronaut Alan Shepard became the first American in space less than a month later, in May 1961. But during his flight, he made it to space, but, but was unable to make an orbit, that round trip around the Earth, like I had just narrated previously. Alan Shepard was unable to make an orbit similar to what Gagarin did, as mentioned just now. Then again, I don't think a great many people could have done what Gagarin did, given the time and day, which highlights the part that he played during those opening years of the space age. Swoosh. If you enjoyed this type of content and the things that we do here on Science Epic's 60 Years of the Space Age, be sure to help us out by dropping a donation on our Patreon. Check it out. It's in the link down below. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time. Boop!